Okay, so yeah, machine learning ground state density function from Kiron Gurke. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for the invitation. And I had hoped to be there, but life got complicated uh, and it didn't seem practical uh, to come in person. Uh, so, so I will talk about, uh, in fact, I will focus on the ground state density functional theory. I'm using uh, machine learning to find ground state functionals. Uh, tomorrow, possibly, we can discuss uh, time dependent DFT. Uh, okay, so uh, what I'll be doing is sort of summarizing a bunch of work I and others have been doing over the last about 10 years. Uh, so I will give background about how you think about this problem of learning functionals using modern machine learning techniques. And I will go into some background about static correlation uh, and this way of doing electronic structure in one dimension that we have in order to test out ideas. And I, there will be some emphasis on the importance of the energy. Uh, then I'll spend a bunch of the time on something we call the cone sham regularizer, which is a way of using your, your cone sham iterations themselves to find the functional, uh, to basically to regularize uh, the machine learning method. And that was work that came out, I think at the start of this year, but then also I hope to have time uh, to tell you about a little extension of that. Okay, this is my group where it was, uh, last academic year, and uh, the people whose work I'll emphasize are Ryan Peterson, who's a physics graduate student, Chris Chen, an, an extremely good undergraduate, uh, Bupali Kalita is, is a, a chemistry student, and Ryan McCarthy was a postdoc in the group now working for a machine learning company in New York. So all our work using machine learning has been aimed at finding functionals. So unlike many of the other things you'll hear about in the workshop, we're not finding force fields, which has been very successful and has had lots of important applications. Uh, we're going after finding functionals. And you, when you're trying to find functionals, you can think of three ways they can improve things. Generality, do they generalize uh, better to say parts of the periodic table that we're not so good at? Are they more accurate for things we know our standard functionals work for? Can we get higher accuracy? Or they might be more efficient. They may save uh, lots of computer time. And two functionals that uh, we would like to approximate. One is the, the cone sham kinetic energy functional. We know from the theorems of DFT, if we had a sufficiently accurate and inexpensive recipe for that, kinetic energy functional, we wouldn't have to solve the cone sham equation. Uh, and then the second thing is the exchange correlation itself, which of course is the focus of modern DFT research. Can you come up with better approximations for that? So we wanna design new density functional approximations. And again, there's a sort of two flavors of that. One is to take the forms that people have used uh, for a long time, uh, the approximations that we've developed over about a century and see if we can do better with those approximate forms. And then the other is to create entirely new functional approximations. So in principle, your method can look at the entire density and construct some, some approximation uh, that uses all the density information, not just local or semi-local or whatever. So the first problem uh, we looked at, I was at a, a math meeting at IPAM here in UCLA and I ran into Klaus Robert Mueller. We were both giving introductions to our subject and he's an expert in especially support vector machines. And we asked a simple question, could you find the kinetic energy of non-interacting electrons as a functional of their density? So we set up a 
simple toy problem, particles in a box with different potentials. We do 2000 examples to train on and we set up a uh, uh, kernel ridge regression, which is a very simple way uh, shown here. Kinetic energy is written simply as a sum of kernel, uh, kernels evaluated on the training densities. But these kernels uh, are simple Gaussian kernels, but in the L2 difference between the densities. So this is a functional of the density everywhere in the system. So completely non-local, totally different from anything that people have done. Within uh, a week or two, we could get highly accurate uh, kinetic energy densities for this problem uh, with about 100 data points. We then discovered that the derivatives uh, of, uh, of these uh, machine learned functionals were very poor, but we figured out a way of projecting onto, onto the directions using PCA uh, in which the derivatives were good and could still, and then find self-consistent densities as it were, uh, that were not as accurate, but still gave us chemical accuracy, I, I guess, with about 200 data points. So that was the, our first uh, adventure in using machine learning, but basically we could get, we could drive the accuracy uh, as far as we wanted to uh, by uh, using more and more training. Okay, but that was a little problem just to see whether or not you, you could get the kinetic energy functional that way. Uh, okay, uh, then skip forward to about four years ago, I think, uh, so we did a collaboration with uh, uh, Mark Tuckerman, uh, Tuckerman's group doing mole uh, molecular dynamics. And what we did was we took this technology and it took quite a while uh, to use, uh, take realistic calculations of this molecule. We, we heat it up. We do molecular dynamics at about 500 Kelvin. We take snapshots and then use similar techniques to uh, find uh, the kinetic energy functional and then run, this is an MD simulation with, the, with that kinetic energy functional. And what was cute about this is in the simulation, we got this proton transfer, which did not occur in the training data. Now our accuracy was uh, lower at the place where the proton transferred because we didn't have training data, but one could always take a snapshot and do a cone sham calculation and update, which it turns out is a little expensive when you're doing things like kernel ridge regression. Uh, but, but the main thing was that you could get forces accurate enough out of the uh, machine learned functional in order to uh, make this simulation work. Now, we also had to give up on our original method of projecting uh, the, gr uh, the gradient because uh, it became too expensive as we went to a much more complex system. And so uh, one has to watch out for that when starting from simple model systems. More recently, I guess this was uh, uh, about a year and a half ago uh, or less, we did uh, calculations where uh, we, instead of training on the cone sham DFT results, uh, we train, we corrected them uh, using uh, CCSDT to more accurate uh, uh, energies and use that as input into our, our machine learning method. Uh, and uh, we were able to actually learn the difference between the DFT results and the CCSDT uh, results uh, by uh, training on that. And here's from, from that paper. This is just a simple illustration. We get to something much more complicated. But if you take a water molecule, uh, it turns out this is PBE. Uh, but if you compress it or stretch it a lot, then you begin to see substantial errors relative to a uh, couple cluster. Uh, but what is more important is that those errors are very, very smooth. So this is this here is the learning the PBE energy, but of course it goes to a certain fixed error relative to CCSDT. 
And now we learn on the couple cluster energies and, and we go down to essentially zero because we're using that as the reference. But this curve here is the difference between, is learning the difference between the two. And you can see that as, as a function of the amount of training, it, it converges much more rapidly. So uh, it was much easier to learn this difference. And again, down here, we see some contour plots around the minimum of, of the potential energy surface in PVE and a couple cluster. And again, the difference between them is, is very, very smooth. So we were able to use that to uh, avoid uh, having, you know, we could run the simulation a couple cluster accuracy by running uh, basically a PBE uh, molecular dynamics. And this is resource and all. And what's going on here is showing that the PBE, uh, a PBE trajectory where this thing is rotating, uh, there's a rotational barrier that PBE gets quite wrong. And so uh, this is the PBE trajectory and, and these other guys are the CCSDT trajectories. One of them is, is using the accurate uh, PBE density and the other one is using the machine learned density. And in either case, you get a totally different trajectory because uh, because of this difference in the, in the rotational barrier. Okay, so so th those are our uh, examples in the real world of using machine learning to find the kinetic energy functional. Uh, so and the pr in principle, you, what you want to be able to do is, of course, apply it to any system at all. Those functionals have been they don't explore chemical space, they sort of explore configuration space for a small molecule. So many different con configurations of the same atoms, uh, it works very well. And it generalizes a little bit when you swap around which atoms there are, but it isn't as designed to give you a, a general purpose density functional. Uh, okay, so here, what I wanna talk about now is I'm gonna switch gears a bit and talk about exchange correlation rather than the kinetic energy functional. And I'm gonna talk about strong correlation. So cases where our standard human designed functional tend to fail and can we use machine learning to do better? Uh, so essentially all standard approximations tend to fail uh, as the bond is stretched. So of course there's a big problem with strongly correlated systems and materials uh, science, uh, uh, but also a, a one, let's say, partial version of that is simply stretching bonds in chemistry. So it's often called static correlation. Uh, and, and you often see the effects of accuracy, even at equilibrium, there is some remnant of this static correlation uh, when you have multiple bonds. Uh, and that's why we mix some fraction of exchange with GGAs and global hybrids. Now, interestingly, not so many people know this. Uh, there was a paper uh, that's uh, 1996 by David Tozer. Uh, and these people were the first people, as far as I know, to use, they used a neural network uh, to find a, uh, ex a ex exchange correlation potentials. Uh, by they would calculate them uh, highly accurately by reverse engineering out of a quantum chemical calculation. And then they used a neural network to try to create a, a better functional that had better exchange correlation potentials. And this was 96 during the first, uh, the earlier sort of revolution in, in machine learning. Okay, so this bond breaking issue, right? This is a standard thing for people doing DFT. This is an old paper, a comment in science from Mai Tao Yang and Paula Mori Sanchez and Aaron Cohen, just illustrating this is H2, or you can look at H2 plus as well, and you see that the, the, they dissociate to the wrong value. Uh, okay, so, so the work I'm gonna show you is based uh, on ideas that came out of uh, Osamu Sugino's group at Tokyo, uh, and especially this excellent uh, young graduate student, Ryo Nagai, 
Uh, so what they had done was they had taken standard density functional approximations and they had shown that if you included both uh, information about the energy and the densities and using highly accurate densities from couple cluster theory, they were able to just looking at three or four different molecules uh, come up with functionals that worked reasonably well for 150 molecules so that generalized extremely well. So by using the density as well as the energy, they were able to uh, sort of generalize particularly well. Uh, now, they were still using approximate functionals. And if you look at the details of the paper, the approximations that they come up with sometimes work better, not, but not always compared to other people's functionals. OK, so there were certain limitations. This was very, uh, you know, very good work, uh, but they, they only used semi-local approximations. In terms of machine learning technology, they uh, weren't, they didn't have access to the gradients, so they would do Monte Carlo steps, which is extremely inefficient. Uh, but they got these very competitive results with just three molecules. And uh, it got me to thinking, you know, how, how is the density helping in this process? And actually Rio came to visit us for a few months and we went sort of through it in lots and lots of detail. Uh, okay, so a slight aside, uh, over the last 10 years or so, I've been building this thing, this 1D electronic structure lab. And the idea has been in order to be able to test uh, ideas in the electronic structure uh, more rapidly than you normally can. So especially for strongly correlated materials, and especially, uh, yeah, especially when you're looking interested in the thermodynamic limit. So hold on my um, area. Uh, so we have a very efficient solver, uh, density matrix renormalization group for 1D problems. Uh, it essentially gives you exact answers for 1D. Mostly it's applied to model Hamiltonians, uh, it's the sort of standard for when you want to get as accurate an answer as you can for model Hamiltonian in strongly correlated physics. And the advantage is it was invented by Steve White, who was here at UCI. Uh, so what we did with this about seven or eight years ago was we sort of created uh, this real space Hamiltonian, uh, we used exponential attractions. There's a lot of reasons of efficiency to use a simple exponential. We tuned it to mimic uh, the soft Coulomb that people often use in these one dimensional systems. You have to, you can't use the pure Coulomb because it's uh, too singular in one dimension. Uh, we typically use about 20 grid points per atom. So, it's like a very, very extended Hubbard model, uh, but uh, with 20 sites uh, per atom. And so since you can usually use it to do about 2000 uh, uh, points, you can use it for up to 100 atoms. And again, an advantage of 1D is that at 100, you're pretty close to the infinite limit. And so you can easily extrapolate. Uh, so you can see what goes on. Uh, as the system becomes infinite. And one of our early uh, results was we could look at the, this prototypical example of a, a Mott, of Mott Hubbard physics of an insulating system that's a chain of hydrogen atoms. And of course, uh, there's one electron per site. So the cone sham system is always a half filled band and therefore is always metallic. And here we were just showing that uh, we would run this, this n is the number of sites. Uh, we have a large spacing between the sites and we calculate finite numbers and extrapolate to infinity and the cone sham gap, uh, you can see is gonna vanish in the, in the thermodynamic limit, but you can show that the, uh, we find that the true gap is about 10 volts. So this is this iconic example of the Kong Cham gap being exactly zero and hugely underestimating 
the, the true gap. It's not supposed to match the true gap. Okay, and here's our 1D version of, of that, that bonding curve that I showed for H2. And you see that it has all the sort of standard features that it has in three dimensions where you get a decent approximation with LDA, uh, but it goes to the wrong limit. It breaks symmetry at a Coulson Fisher point, just like in Hartree Fock. And here's the true well depth uh, from our DMRG calculation. And we see that the LDA uh, well depth is, is very is is still pretty good because if you measure it from the LDA dissociated atoms, okay. Uh, and the, yeah, there's the three D curve. Okay, so now uh, so we use that. This is before we started doing machine learning stuff. Uh, uh, well, we use it. Sorry, uh, in some early machine learning stuff, still using our uh, our uh, uh, kernel rate regression, uh, and I had an excellent student, Lee Lee, a physics student, and and by using various tricks uh, from chemistry, actually, we were able to set up uh, our our scheme our, uh, that we uh, that we had previously used for the. Kinetic energy, we actually applied it to both the kinetic energy and the exchange correlation energy, actually directly to the F in the Holmberg Cone theorem. And this is showing that this is at a not so strongly correlated separation, but how we could get to chemical accuracy by training on about um, uh, 80 examples, we could get to uh, the uh, infinite the thermodynamic limit within chemical accuracy. So, so using our old methods, uh, we were able to do that. Okay, so the, this more recent work now uh, that I'm gonna tell you about, uh, well, here I'm showing you various examples from the literature. Lots of people are interested uh, in, in, in finding potentials from, from machine learning. Which is, which is sort of fine by itself, but uh, I'll explain why we sort of focus on densities and energies. Uh, so wh why, why is the energy so important? So uh, if you think about it, almost all applications of ground state DFT are designed to produce energies, not potentials and, and not even density. Uh, you can show that most energy errors are dominated by the error in the functional, not the error in the density. Uh, and the map between densities and potentials is notoriously tricky. So when you try to learn the potential, you're sort of trying to learn something uh, that can be very hard to learn and may not be in fact necessary. Uh, so why, why the density? Uh, so the density, if you think about it, is <coughs> all possible derivatives of the energy with respect to the one body potential. That by definition, that is what the density is. Uh, it obviously contains the forces, because uh, those are derivatives. And uh, so, so in fact, if you have a scheme that produces the energy, uh, it automatically, uh, determines the density by via this exact condition right so and of course if you directly use the density then you don't have to worry about what the potential is doing uh, okay so this yeah this came out i guess at the start of this year so so lee lee who had been my graduate student grew up went off and joined google as accelerated science and this is the team from from google and then uh, this is myself and Ryan, a uh, more recent uh, physics graduate student. So, so this work, uh, what we did was we used a neural network, uh, not the uh, kernel ridge regression, and we, we applied it uh, to the whole cone champ scheme. So, uh, so, well, one thing I should mention is we used a lot of differential programming uh, and back back propagation, so we had the gradients analytically, uh, and so we could uh, we could uh, 
uh, do much more efficient calculations than Rio had done originally. Uh, and we so leaded uh, uh, most of this and figured out how to get this thing to work. Uh, Lee and Stefan. Okay. So, so what we do is we, we set up this cone sham regularizer scheme, which I'll describe. And here are these, it's still 1D H2 binding curves. And we can have the machine try to find a local approximation or GGA or use global information about the density. So uh, what was remarkable is that we were able to get to learn the entire binding energy curve using just two uh, training points and one validation point. So, so the, these, these orange circles here are, the uh, orange diamonds are the training points and the, the black triangle is a validation point. And what you see is that you always get this, you know, uh, dissociating to the wrong value if you insist on LDA or GGA, but if you use the entire density you can actually get chemical accuracy along the entire binding energy curve from just two data points. Now, these are chosen carefully. One is near equilibrium and one is basically past the, this coulson fisher point. So one of them is learning about sort of equilibrium uh, physics and the other one is learning about stretched physics. Uh, okay, so the scheme uh, is that we, set it up so that uh, you do your cone, you know, you have an initial version of the functional, uh, which is almost random at the beginning, uh, and then you start running your cone sham calculation. But now it remembers uh, not just the final energy, but also the, I think, 15 energies before that. And it uses that to, to ensure that the functional that it creates is in, in a sense smooth and doesn't sort of uh, jump too far. And we're also at the end point, we look at the loss in the density. So what happens uh, by looking at the, again, the L2 norm, uh, the error in the density. So as you go along, it, it trains and it alters the functional to recover these two points and their densities which means it's also telling it about an awful lot of derivatives. Now, if you keep on going, uh, it will go sort of too far. It will overfit the density, which is why uh, we need to regularize it uh, and use the validation point. So this, this, this here is a projection of the densities on uh, two axes. Uh, and what it's showing is the sort of epochs where it's, it's training and testing. So it starts off here with a very bad density. And then uh, as you iterate, it goes along uh, sort of one of these, these curves. And this region here is a region of very high accuracy in the density. And sort of midway along, it's got this blue trajectory. And then uh, later it has this purple one. And if we look to see, so in the first one, it hasn't learned much at all. And so the density is still very poor. Uh, this is uh, the initial and final density. But now along this blue trajectory, we see that as it moves along, it gives you a very accurate uh, density. And then uh, if you keep going, it will overfit the density and so, these errors are tiny as it moves around here uh, and it's gone too far. Okay, so, so what you do is you use the, valid, sorry, the validation point to stop it uh, so that it doesn't overfit. And, and, uh, and what we found then is that indeed as, as sort of Rio's work had suggested, it generalizes extremely well. You can get the entire binding energy curve, not just for H2, but for H4, if you train with two data points, uh, two separations of H4, uh, we could set it up so that it was self-interaction free. So H2 plus comes out right. And then we even did H2, H2, uh, just looking at them as they come together and found that uh, it did that not quite chemically accurate, but close to that with no training at all. 
no. Okay. Uh, and, you know, you could compare this to, you know, using the full KSR, using sort of the previous iterations uh, and the density, or just not using the density at all. And you can see that it learns much faster when, when you have these things turned on. Uh, and you could check, we could check, we could do the uh, cone jam inversion to get the cone jam potential uh, for the final densities. And again, you can see that the density is much more accurate uh, uh, once we do the full KSR instead of just using the energies to drain. Okay, so future directions. Uh, we wanted to generalize to spin DFT. This was done with, with pure density functional theory. Uh, many different variations in flavors. Does it work for weak correlation? Uh, we were interested in, in strong static correlation. And does it work for asymmetric cases? All our cases were, uh, were uh, symmetric in space. Uh, so, so this was written up in a, there's a, uh, a review by Bupali uh, from a few months ago. Uh, and the last thing I want to tell you about is the a recent extension that Bupali has led up uh, with Ryan Peterson uh, on, on this, which will actually be talked about as a Europe's workshop uh, in about a week. And there is a version of this on the archive and we've almost finished revising it as a sort of scientific article. That article is designed for people uh, who are, uh, from a computer science background. And the main thing is that we tried it for molecules at equilibrium, the sort of situation that, uh, that Rio had, uh, except we're only doing it in 1D. Uh, so so, so uh, Bupali has done a lot of work, uh, sort of looking at many different situations. Uh, so it's all using the JAX library. And I, I guess all this is available on, on GitHub, or at least Lee's, Lee's stuff is. Uh, so, uh, and yeah, we fixed the total number of cone jam iterations, but things are converged. Uh, and yes, so, so these are the details of how, uh, how that was done. And you can use either GPUs or CPUs. Uh, and what we did uh, was trained just on atomic systems uh, uh, and validated on one atomic system and then tested on, on molecules. So just using atomic data. Uh, now one consistency test, and these kinds of tests are things that I try to encourage people to do uh, to better understand their machine learning techniques and to check that everything is okay, is we, we would feed it LDA densities and energies and then ask it to find a functional so this is a bit like an auto encoder it's sort of checking that the, the machine will send back the functional you sent it in the first place uh, and so indeed uh, when we pull out the the cone sham lda the, sorry the the ksr L, lda that comes out of training it on on true lda densities and energies we get out the uniform gas uh, energies, the same thing that we've put in everywhere except for uh, in places where the density is too high. And so if it didn't have any training data for that, it wouldn't know about that. So that is nice that it comes out consistently. Uh, sorry, my camera uh, had a little drop of rain on it. Uh, okay, exchange correlation potentials. Uh, we get them by the usual functional differentiation. They look a little uh, not so good uh, in this case. Uh, this is using the global cone sham regularizer, but, uh, but that will be checked very carefully. The densities are all very good. It's just the way the potential tends to look. Uh, okay, so, so, so and in that case, we were able to get about three millihartries uh, accuracy for the molecules at equilibrium uh, for energy and energy differences. So still about double 
uh, uh, twice, uh, you know, too big for uh, chemical accuracy, but but very close. So it is working. It is working in the uh, uh, in spin DFT, not just DFT. Uh, and of course, once we have this set up, uh, people test it for uh, uh, 3D. That will be very interesting. Uh, so uh, now, the, and the, these these are other works that people that have appeared uh, since about using you know learning. Uh, exchange correlation using differential programming. Okay, uh, so to summarize, so we can use machine learning to create a new functional uh, that correctly dissociates. In our case, the key trick was using the cone sham iterations. Uh, it seems to generalize well in the sense of, you know, once it's trained for a couple of data points, we can get whole binding energy curves. Oh, and I wanted to mention that today, I happen to know there'll be a new paper in science that'll appear in about five hours, I think, uh, by Kirkpatrick et al. from Google DeepMind with Aaron Cohen and Paula Mari Sanchez, where they have, uh, let's say, created a new functional that's pretty impressive uh, using machine learning methods. So uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. Okay. So we have time for uh, discussion questions. So there is Hannes. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, Kiran. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Also, very nice to see the sun rising in the background. <laughs> <laughs> very impressive. <laughs> Um, I, have, I have two short questions. So one is, um, I, I really like this 1D uh, electronic structure lab that you've created. Um, uh, is that code also available? Uh, it, <laughs> it should be. Uh, it ought to be, right? Uh, I'm just not up to date. I have to check with my guys. So some fraction. So. So certainly all the sort of DMRG stuff uh, is, is available through uh, the sort of tensor network things uh, and sort of in terms of matrix product states and stuff. But the DFT version, you know, we, we've had several attempts to make it public, uh, but I'm not certain what the current state is, right? What tends to happen is the, especially the improvements in sort of quantum information make the DM, always make the DMRG parts more important than the DFT part. Uh, so so I, I'll check with my guys to see what, and, and I had a big push, I think uh, last summer to try to get that done. But now that I think about it, I haven't heard, you know, I would have had a link or something to it uh, if, if that was completed. Okay, I gotta get okay. Back. but I'll, I'll keep a lookout for it. Yes. Uh, the other thing is, I mean, certainly, you know, uh, if you contact us, we can yeah. we can give you all the stuff, right? But it ought to be on Jax or something like this because okay, cool, cool. much more people would use it. Yeah. And, and the other short question, maybe, um, when you say the these these functionals in the end, they were they were global functionals, right? The best one, yeah. the best performing ones. So that means that you basically have your grid, and and the whole grid goes into the neural network, kind of. So yes. this, this would not be size extensive then, or somehow, uh, you know, you could train on small things and uh, apply it to big ones or? Yes, so, and this, this is a limitation of, I think pretty much everything I've been involved with. Uh, so some people like to think, well, okay, well, you know, whatever system you have, you put it on a huge, huge grid, uh, and so then you have access to all the density and you can do this kind of thing. But this is sort of naive, right? People will always come up with, you know, different systems and, you know, uh, uh, you know, something that won't fit on your grid and so forth. And you want bulk systems. So, uh, so what we really need to do next is study this, how this thing does it and figure out what features it's using, a bit like we were hearing about in the last talk, uh, figure out what features it's actually using. And those ones 
could then be uh, you know, transferable to other systems, right? Is it using a local number of electrons and stuff like this, right? Makes sense, yeah. So see how non-local it really has to be kind of. Yes, and it's kind of amusing because if you think of the local density approximation, you know, it just looks at the density at a point and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't care about anything else going on anywhere. And so it automatically takes care of all these problems. Yeah, yeah it's, it's remarkable. <laughs> That's true. Okay, right. thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, Andreas. Thanks. Um, uh, Kiron, is, this, is it too early for you for nasty jokes? Please, it's never too early for nasty jokes. Well, I know, just I, I thought with, with um, this the number of points you get a Morse curve. A more? For H2, you have three points, three parameters, or some, some Morse curve. <laughs> no, more seriously now, just uh, uh, have you thought about it? So, uh, when uh, Van Leeuwen and Barnes use potentials to generate functionals. You remember they had this, they varied, oh, there was in the 90s, they had, they said, if I can get functionals, if I change the system, for example, the nuclear charge, and from the integration of the, over the path of changing the nuclear charge, for example, I can get the functional. Yes. And I think, and they said at that time, they said it's, no hope to do with something like it's much too expensive. But now as you go to machine learning, this expensive problem does not exist anymore. And that might be a way, if, I, if my intuition is right. So that might be a way that could be exploited to see if something can be done in this direction. Yes, so if I'm thinking of the right paper, what, what Andreas is referring to is there's a sort of line integral formula where you basically take the, take the atoms at infinity and you uh, bring them up to the distance that you want them to be at. And if you integrate over, is, it, is that the one you're talking about? Yes, Andreas? no, any yeah. parameter. You put any yeah, parameter, yeah. You are, any number, it can, be, it can be the nuclear charges, but this is so the moment you start from some known potential and you look, you go to another system, you change continuously the system to another, to know how to change the potentials. So you can get the functional from the potentials and the potential seems something which is much more natural to have than the functional, it's defined locally, it has many nice features, you know how to get it, reasonable potentials. And so they said, look, this would be a way to generate functionals from potentials. Uh, yes, yeah. so so I have thought a little bit about that, but I haven't found a way to make it actually, you know, give me a new approximation. Uh, but it could be explored with this because the, the difficulty part of it, you no, know, just getting all the potentials on the potentials on the path is normal. Just, well, just, you don't want yes. to have something, but now. Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, Yes, I'll think about it some more. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, that that was it. <laughs> okay. I do, I want, don't want to monopolize. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay. We have here um, Mikael and then Matthias. Mikael, please. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Good. Great. Uh, so first, thanks. Of, thanks very much for this enlightening talk. Um, I have a maybe naive question. So basically, if I get it right, what you're doing in this 1D toy case is that you have a, you have like an inner standard DFT, inner like energy minimization. And on top of that, you have an outer minimization to minimize the parameters of your, of your model, right? So I was wondering, can you sort of fuse the loops? Like, can you sort of, you know, across the data set at the same time, minimize the DFT energy and the parameters? I mean, if, you're, if you can compute the gradients, that should be possible, right? Sort of like, and then as you're going along, you're like kicking out the parts which are converged. I don't know, it's, it's just a crazy idea. I don't know, have you thought about doing that? Is it, do you think that's sensible in any sense? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm quite following the, uh, the uh, what, what you're suggesting. So can so you say it again? Yeah, so basically if you're, if you're doing your 15 steps of, of Concham DFT, I mean, you're essentially minimizing the energy with respect to the density, that's the matrix if you want, right? 
Yes. That's like an inner minimization. And then you do that across the data set, or across your two points. And then as, a, as an outer minimization, you're sort of like minimizing the loss with respect of that whole chain with respect to the parameters of your model, of your neural network model. But of right. course, in principle, you could fuse the loops, couldn't you? Right? Do a minimization. Ab ab absolutely right and in fact one of the reasons it's taken us a l quite a longer than we thought to even do these sort of experiments where we're doing the weekly correlated thing and you say well that's sort of easier almost right uh is is <laughs> simply the number of possibilities right <laughs> of things to try is, is so huge right or even not so much even trying things out but checking that the things we've sort of done how relevant they are uh turns out i mean that's a problem with a lot of this this machine learning stuff is if you take it the way that the computer scientists tend to use it they don't they often don't do any of these tests they sort of find something that works and they go with that but it's important to tell people about it uh, and, and then if people use it, they find out how much it generalizes and so forth. On the other hand, you can spend your life sort of thinking of many possible variations, right? And things that are interesting to look at and never publish anything because, uh, because there are so many different ways of combining things. So we're always trying to find this midway point where we've done some of the tests that we would like to do as scientists without spending <laughs> all our time. So, so yes, there are all these interesting com uh, combinations. There are almost too many of them, right? Yeah. So in a certain sense, you kind of go, you know, you find something that works, you test it a bit, you try to publish it, and then you sort of make sort of variations to see what's going on. Uh, but there, there's, there's so many possibilities, yeah. Uh, so, so when we, you know, when we say, you know, the cone champ uh, iterations, like, yeah, the, the, you could just rearrange this in many different ways, and 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 we often go down rabbit holes where we're just trying out too many different things. Sure. So, what just what what got me wondering is that like fixing this to fifteen iterations is sort of an arbitrary choice, of course, and that seems like something you would like to avoid. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, well, okay. So the 15 iterations was, no, no. So what it was, it's interesting because this took some sort of tuning. So it's the last 15 iterations. Oh, okay. And in fact, we have a, it's a weighted sum of them. So, uh, you know, it uses most the last iteration and then 10% uh, less of the previous and 10% less of the one before that and so forth. So at first we set it up using all the iterations but then we realized you know it was wasting lots of time on the bad iterations at the start uh you know where you were jumping around a bit uh and it was quite inaccurate and it was trying to use you know it would always have that information in there and try to use it to learn stuff and it wasn't very helpful uh so then we sort of cut off uh, how far back from the final iteration it went. So in the end, it's 15, uh, had enough info of the past, but wasn't dominated by its past. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and all these things are like that, right? You, you play yeah. with them, do something sensible, yeah. and once it starts working, then okay, it's working. <laughs> uh, why it's working, you know, uh, is another deeper question. All right, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so, Matthias, please. Thank you. Hi, Kieran. Hi, Matthias. So, thanks for the overview. It's, uh, it's beautiful to see how the machine learned functionals have evolved. Uh, my question refers to the Concham regularizer. So, I would, I would view this as one way to include domain knowledge. In this case, like part of the algorithm, right? And you constrain the model space by that. My question, which you may have partially answered already, is another way for this would be to include known asymptotic limits of the functional, right? And do you think you could include them in your model? Ah, uh, well, in, in, in lots of other work, right? We, we do that, right? 
Uh, and but we were sort of not. You're right. We're we're not doing that here, really. I mean, there are a few things like the self-interaction thing uh, uh, we we have in there, uh, but we haven't done the full thing. Uh, so, you know, yes, one can do that. Although often it's it's usually not quite straightforward, right? If you take your sort of standard machine learning technology off the shelf. It usually will not respect those kinds of things, and then it turns out that it's a bit of a game, right? You have to work a, a little bit to ad adapt it to build in those limits. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. You would have to adapt the model you training or architecture. We, we had some experience on that, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I was yeah. wondering, right? I and mean, what you expect is to. You mentioned already that not all. Um, uh, improvements of the model necessarily lead to a strong improvement in the outcome, right? So would you would you expect these limits to be of much use? Oh, I, probably I not. see what you're saying. Uh, well, okay, so so there is a paper we did with uh, uh, Jacob Hollingsworth, I think is the first author, uh, me and Lee, about five years ago, where we built in uh, the kinetic energy functional, the fact that it scales quadratically uh, with, with density, uh, the uniform scaling of the density. So based on an idea of John Snyder's, we, we figured out how to implement that. And we found that it depended a bit on the set of densities you were trying to learn. So, and I don't, not sure this is actually in the final paper, but it's something I sort of figured out about a year later, uh, which is that, in some problems, you know, the, the putting in these exact conditions is relevant to constraining the energetics, and in some it is not. So it really depends on the sort of domain of densities you're trying to make your functional work on. Uh, that sounds intuitive. Uh, yes, uh, but so so people, you know including myself, right? Say, oh, you know, we put in exact conditions, the more exact conditions, the better it will be. At least I used to say that. I don't say that anymore. I say, you got to put in the conditions that are relevant to the problems you want to improve on. Uh, and and so, so, so yes, yeah, so it was, you know, whether or not the glass was half full or half empty, I'm not sure, right? Uh, in some cases it helped and, and in other cases it would seem to be irrelevant. Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, so what? So let me just emphasize, you know, tonight or tomorrow morning, depending on where you are in the world, you might want to take a look at that science article. Which shows, I would say, at the very least, illustrates how useful it can be to do this kind of stuff. So I would say this science article that's going to appear builds on lots of stuff that lots of people have done and does something pretty good uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, was it Kirkpatrick? Kirkpatrick is the first author. There's about 20 authors. Most of them, I think, are from DeepMind. Uh, and you'll see okay. uh, uh, what they've achieved. And it's in exactly this space of trying to learn the functional uh, from, from data and using a multi-layer perceptron. Yeah. Oh, I am looking forward to that. Thanks. Yeah, we all will. Okay. Um, I do not see any pressing question now. Well, in that case, uh, definitely thank Kiron again. Thank you.